right, good morning. How's everybody today? We have a great day ahead of us. I, I'm always excited when we have a service that includes a baptism. That'll be at the end of the service today, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, Brother Caleb is going to be preaching this morning, looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, we uh, have... Boy, my brain just totally locked. Did you see it? Did you see the train derail? I had a thought in my head, and it just kind of flew away. Yeah, yeah, just, just, just gone. Just, just totally gone. Thank you very much, Willie. Thank you, Willie. Yes, I'll be here all week. Yes. Uh, anyway, no, I, that's what it was. I couldn't remember what I was going to tell you. Yes, uh, Brother Scott is uh, not here today. Uh, Esther is still in the hospital. Lord willing, she will be able to get out of the hospital tomorrow. We're, we'll see. Uh, the doctors said it would be at least Monday before they release her. Um, they, if you do not know, Esther had to go back. They had to go back and redo part of the surgery again and uh, due to a bleed that she had from that uh, previous surgery. And so uh, she's doing well. They've got her up walking and um, doing things. Uh, so they're, everything's on track, this, you know, doing, doing everything just fine. Uh, unfortunately, it means she has to start all over on her process of healing and everything. But they are, um, they're working with her. Hopefully, Lord willing, they'll get to come home tomorrow. We'll, we'll see how the doctors say. But things are going on track. Please keep praying for them. Uh, so Scott is at the hospital with her and uh, staying with her. Caleb was preaching today anyway. And so, you know, he's like, we told him, just, just stay. It's fine. We don't need you. You know, we got your dad here. He's, we're good. We're, you know, yeah. Larry, how you doing? You feeling better? Yeah, he had a couple of a couple of stints put in, or st how many stints? We just one stint, and a balloon, a stint and a balloon. So he's doing real good now. He he and I are having a marathon race at the end now. When, so no, just kidding. But anyway, so uh, things are things are doing going well, very well this morning, and uh, we want to welcome you this morning. If you are our guest, if you've never been with with us before, we want you to know that you're an answer to our prayers. We pray for God to bring people to us, to visit with us, to be our guests, and hopefully to eventually join with us uh, and be a part of our family. Uh, if you're interested in information about the church, you can. Uh, check at the connect desk before you leave we'd love for you to stop by there there's a little packet they can give you if you haven't already received one it's got a little gift in there to say thank you for being a part of our service today uh, also give you a chance to register on our guest registry uh, you can do that uh, sit right where you're sitting if you'd like in the bulletin i got one right there there is a qr code inside and you can scan that qr code it will take you straight to our website to the guest registry on there and uh, you can register as our guest or just stop by the connect desk and they'll get your information and it'll just give us a chance to send you a thank you letter and say thank you for for coming and being a part of our service today and also see if, if there's any way that we can uh, minister to you be a part of our uh, family we have our members uh, membership meeting that is coming uh, uh, membership class is what I'm trying to say coming up Sunday September the 18th so if you're looking for a church home uh, this is the process that you go. They have a connect meal that we had last week. Gives you a chance to meet the staff and all that. You don't have to take these in any particular order, but the, uh, September the 18th is a membership class. It's a two-hour class with lunch uh, in the afternoon, so you can sign up for that at the connect desk, and that will give, they can give you the information you need for that. Um, members meeting will be tonight so we're having for all of our church members uh six o'clock tonight we're having members meeting and uh so we're, we're still going to go through with that even though brother scott's not here he, he sent me all the stuff and we'll it's it's not there's not a lot to cover so we're going to do that we'll still have a time of worship time of prayer and then do our uh, business stuff for the night so uh, be, here, be here at six o'clock tonight uh, because we're having the members meeting at six o'clock we're backing up choir and orchestra so the choir will be at 4 30 and the orchestra will be at five that gives us our normal time to be ready by six o'clock for uh, for the members meeting our kids fall what did I say? I said it backwards, didn't I? Orchestra will be at 4.30 and the choir will be at 5. I can hear people in my in ears going, he's saying it backwards. He said it backwards. I can hear, by the way, all these microphones around are on in my ears. So if you're whispering in the back of the sanctuary, I can hear you. So just so you know that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can hear all that stuff. So anyway, Dr. Mike, I, I can hear you, my brother. Yeah, all right. Anyway, uh, Kids Fall program will be kicking off on Wednesday, September the 7th. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Lord's Supper service will be September the 11th at 6 p.m. And uh, I think that's all the announcements that 
that I have, and uh, we, we are excited about today. We're going to uh, begin things with a scripture. It's Psalm 133, the first three verses, or all the thing, all of it. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. How good and how pleasant it is when, this, when all of us as a family dwell together in unity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, worship you today, to lift your name in praise. And I pray that you would be with those in our hearts. Pray especially for Esther and for our Pastor Scott. Lord, just be with them. And I pray for uh, just very uh, perfect healing uh, for Esther, that she would have no further complications and that be able to come home tomorrow and, and get this thing on the move and get everything back to to our normal schedule and Lord we just praise you for all that you've done and, and Lord if there's others on our hearts I pray that you would deal with each uh, one as, as you see fit so that you can receive the honor and the glory and the praise and Lord we just thank you so much for loving us for it's in Christ's name we pray amen all right let's stand together we'll get everybody in place uh, get the choir standing up and the ladies up here to sing and I love I came across this song forever we sing hallelujah and the first time I heard it I thought oh my you know sometimes there's a song that that's just it just speaks and it absolutely speaks volumes and this one is one of those that just absolutely uh, thrilled my heart and I love to sing it with you let's sing it together forever we sing hallelujah <clears throat>
had the power to conquer death, to conquer hell, to conquer the grave, to conquer sin, and conquer everything that could ever defeat us. And if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we know that He will give us eternal life because He conquered it all for us. promise that Jesus rose from the grave and he is alive that gives us assurance that gives us hope that's the reason you know the Bible says to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you and and the the thing is that's easy because he did all the work in that the hope that's in us when things are falling apart and they see joy and hope in our lives the world sees that in us and they say how can you be so happy when things are going so wrong and you're like oh that's easy Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And that gives you the blessed assurance that we need. Uh, and I love this song. It's a great old hymn. A great, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We're doing this one in, in 12.8. It's a little bit different, but it's, it's fun. So, go ahead, Laura. You want to take it off? Oh, 
that we can praise him all day long. You may be seated. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over
beautiful song. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty. Praise forever to the King of kings. I'm going to sing this last little song, a simple song of praise. We worship you, almighty God, and you alone is our delight. We worship you, O holy God, and lift our voice to sing your praise. And then it goes, Alleluia. We starts to win. Yeah, I'd be lying if I told you I was anything but weak. Run down my struggles all I see. But I'm not giving in. My story will not end in defeat. Nothing can stop me.
a good song that's pretty cool um yeah so this two weeks in a row you don't get to hear from your pastor i'm sorry but uh we'll be excited to have him back next week i'm sure uh, half sorry as we are. i'm not half as sorry as you are that's what he is <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm excited i've <laughs> i i don't know is that okay I mean, i'm excited i'm excited to get to preach and i'm excited to get to preach on this topic uh we've been studying philippians and the youth group uh for the last semester ish and uh, this is not uh, just a continuation of that. This is more of an overview sermon. And so I'm also excited because I haven't done something like this before. So it might be a little interesting. We'll see how that goes. Normally you take one and go verse by verse. And we're going to skip around a lot. So I hope you brought your Bible. You're going to need it. You're going to be skipping around. Uh, I think Amanda is doing the verses. Poor Amanda. She's going to be struggling today, I'm sure. Uh, but before, yeah, you can go ahead and open up to Philippians, and we'll be starting in chapter 1 and verse 1. I was thinking about how to introduce this, and uh, just... I was watching actually a, a doc, documentary kind of thing on um, Pig Trail Nation. They did a thing about Ryan Mallet. And when I started being a hog fan, it was in 2010 and 11, the end of the Petrino years. And you can look at me and tell that dude obviously did not play much football. Uh, but I like watching it. And I was a fan. And Ryan Mallet was the coach. And then this year, Whitehall, the high school that I graduated from, over in Jefferson County, hired him as their head coach. And he was talking about the shared experience of what it means when you have a bunch of guys and you go through practice in the summer for two and a half hours. And I was thinking, the people in this room ha probably have a lot of shared experiences outside of church. We see guys like the, uh, the show Band of Brothers, guys who went through war together, and they had a shared experience that resulted in a really strong bond. Those guys were friends until they died. There are people in this room that had that same experience with people that they went to war with. Uh, even people from uh, the same hometown. You walk into a room, and uh, you start looking for someone that's like you, that you can talk to. And if somebody's from the same hometown, or maybe they had the same job as you, or uh, maybe even your family, that happens pretty often around here. Even if we don't know the person or have any other reason to like them, we're probably going to be friends with that person and get along with that person more than any other. And you can think of different reasons uh, that, that in whatever group you have specific people that uh, you get along with, and a lot of that time, a lot of times, because you had a shared experience, something that happened to you, and our brains, for whatever reason, one or another, uh, they make us like someone and appreciate someone who's went through that thing with us. It's a, a shared ex experience, at least to a shared identity. A lot of times we start to, um, to wrap ourselves up. We say, I'm from Whitehall. That's who I am. That's part of me. Now, I don't always claim that. I, I was a transplant. I just lived there a couple years, so... Uh, I'm just kind of joking about that one, but, but some of you lived in Hot Springs, and you might have lived on the same, in the same house all your life, and that's part of who you are. You're, f you're from this place. It was a circumstance, an experience, then an identity, and maybe even a purpose, like those guys that went to battle together, that resulted in we, we, what we call unity in being one. They had oneness in their identity, how they saw themselves. They didn't just see themselves as an individual person, because we, we really uh, appreciate in America, uh, and especially in the South, our individual rights, don't we? We think of ourselves in a, as an individual, but sometimes we think of ourselves as more than that, as part of a group. 
And I hope you've been a part of something like that. Now the Bible deals with this same issue. And in Philippians, this is an overview sermon. One of the themes is unity. Of being one of how, as a Christian people, we have a shared experience. And a common identity that affects who we are. And then how we interact with the world and with each other. And so before we start, I'm going to pray and ask God to help us through this and help me with it uh, to be able to preach it well. And I'd ask that you pray with me. Um, But this is something that that Jesus prayed for for us um, and that we pray for. As a staff and as a church family, we should always be uh, striving and and working towards unity. So let's pray and ask God to help us through this. Uh, let's let's just go ahead and start doing that right now. (laughs) God, thank you for this day that you've given us as a church to be able to come and to worship. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords, and we are here to praise you. Uh, Lord, we just give you our praise and and our thanks for allowing us to be here. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the word that you've given us to be able to understand and to preach from. Lord, I do ask that you will open it. Open our hearts to you. Remind us of the things that we need to be reminded of. Teach us new things that we haven't heard before. Lord, I ask that you give me humility to be able to preach your word for your glory and help us all to love each other and as a church to have unity more because of the word that we hear today from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, this is a church letter. He says, uh, you know, a lot of the times we have uh, letters in the Bible and we can read this with ourselves in mind, but there was a man, a specific, actually two people, that were writing this to a specific group of people. And so they say to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, They encourage unity, and we're going to get to that point. But first of all, we have to realize that this was for for a specific place and a specific time and a specific people. We have gathered here today on Sunday morning, August 28th, I think, a specific time and a specific place. You are the saints in Lake Hamilton, some of them. There are other churches, but he's talking specifically to one church and one group of people. It says with their bishops or pastors or overseers and deacons. So leadership at all levels and every person in the room at this church. As they read this, they would understand this is for us. And then as as he encouraged unity, they would understand this is for us as a church. So I want us to understand this, but also I kind of want us to go back in time a little bit and get a little bit of understanding into who this church is. And are these really actual people? Are these real people that he was thinking about? And the youth group has heard some of these stories before, uh, but back in Acts chapter 16, you don't have to turn there. Let me make sure that was... Acts 16, yeah. Paul receives a vision to go to Macedonia. He's been trying to go to different places on one of his missionary trips. He was one of the apostles, uh, the one that was the last apostle to be called, and uh, God sends him out uh, to different places to preach the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, and he goes and he starts doing that. And he's trying to go to different places, and, and the Holy Spirit is stopping him. And finally, he has a vision, a dream, and a guy from Macedonia. Uh, it starts to, uh, or not starts to, but just ask him to come and to preach the gospel to him. So him and Silas, who you might remember from a, a certain story, they head there. They head that way. They start walking to Macedonia, and they end up in a place called Philippi. Now, in every place where they went, a lot of times what they would do is they would meet the Jewish people first because they had the most common uh, understanding of God and of the gospel and a background to believe, but they would also preach to Gentiles, people that were not Jewish, that were not like them. The first person they come to is Lydia. She's a Jew, a seller of purple which means uh, she would take expensive purple cloth, that was the color of royalty, and she would sell it to people. So she was probably pretty wealthy, and they find her, and she's praying on the banks of the river with other people. She was a person that believed in God, but she hadn't yet heard about Jesus. She was a Jewish person living in a place without a synagogue to pray in. And they go, and, and then Paul and Silas start to understand that God has sent us to this place for her, so she is saved. It says that the Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. And she's saved and she's baptized. 
Then there's a slave girl. As Paul and Silas are walking through town, there's this girl and she's a slave and she's possessed by a demon. And she keeps, she keeps yelling things that are true. She's saying, servants of the Most High God. And finally, Paul turns around, annoyed as heck at her, and says, leave her, and tells this demon to come out of her because he's tired of this girl running around, following them, and yelling all over the place. But this is one of those people that God works in her life. Even out of Paul's annoyance, God frees this person from sin. And then the most famous one of these, the Philippian jailer. These guys go around and they're preaching and those guys, the owners of that slave girl, have made a lot of money from her uh, and so they were pretty angry and they have them thrown in jail and they're beaten. And then as they're in jail, they're singing praises. They're preaching the gospel so that the other people in the jail can hear what's going on and one of the people that hears is the jailer. And an earthquake comes and uh, the jail breaks apart and the guy is about to kill himself because he's a jailer and he was responsible. He's given the responsibility of taking care of these prisoners. And he knows that they escape, that his life is going uh, to be taken. That was the responsibility that he had. It was very serious. And he's a, as he's about to kill himself, Paul and Silas run out and say, Stop, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. And he falls on his knees and says, a famous line, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he's saved. They say, um, they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and all your household. This wasn't just for one type of person. We had a slave, we had a rich Jewish lady, and we had probably a, a, a middle income type jailer guy. He's a Roman citizen who thought he was about to have to die because this earthquake comes and God shows love to all of these people. He sends Paul and Silas specifically to them at a specific time and in a specific place to make something new out of them and to show his love to them. This is the start of the church in Philippi. And so then as Paul is writing a letter, he's writing with these specific people in mind. He's thinking this, uh, this jailer, I don't know his name, maybe I missed it, but I don't think it's in there. Uh, this jailer is one of the people that he's writing to. He's writing to uh, Lydia, the seller of purple, who might have been a leader in that church. He's thinking about the jailer's wife and maybe that slave girl. He's thinking of Yodia and Syntyche, who he names later. These are all specific people that he wants to encourage to be one. They were shown love by a God that they did not know or seek. And can I remind you of something this morning? At Center Fort Baptist Church in Hot Springs, Arkansas, or Piercy, whatever you want to call it, we have the exact same story. We are people who were different. We might have been same in some of this, and we might have been the same in some ways. But all of us, if you know Jesus, have had the love of God poured out into your heart in the same way. None of us are different in the way that God has saved us. He sees us as people that do not deserve him, that have sinned and that do things that make him hurt. They grieve his heart. But he saw us and he sent people into our lives, whether bringing us to a church where we could hear the gospel or sending a specific person or a family member to preach and share the gospel to us so that we could believe in him and have a relationship with him. And out of that, he has created a church and a group of people where we have a shared experience. The theme of unity uh, and, and uh, kind of the, the central idea of unity in this book is in chapter 2 and it says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, this chapter 2, verse 1, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Basically, and we'll get a little bit more into this, but if there's any consolation, that means encouragement in Christ. Has the Spirit ever comforted you? Have you received the gospel and the love of God poured out into your heart? Then, and that's not really an if statement. Sometimes we say, um, yeah, if you'll take out the trash, we can go and you can have a popsicle or something. That's a conditional, if you do this, then this. What he's saying here is more of a sense. It's like if water is wet and if bricks hurt when you punch them. Like it's this type of serious, this type of obvious thing. If God loves you, 
you, then fulfill my joy. He means, he means then fulfill the greatest purpose of a church by being like-minded. By being one, having the same love. Being of one accord, that means of one spirit in love, of one mind. That love that he talks about, that's the first step. The first way that God creates unity in a church is through love. And the way that he creates unity through love is by first pouring love into us, not requiring it of us. I think this is really cool. Uh, if you can go back to chapter 1 and verse 3, and Paul begins to pray for these people. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. For your fellowship and the gospel from the first day until now. I think it's pretty cool that that first day, he remembers it. It's not some idea. Our church was started a long time ago, but he remembers the day that the first people in this church were saved. He remembers the day that Lydia and the jailer and the slave girl met Jesus. He remembers that day, and he says, I thank God for your fellowship and that gospel, that good news from the first day until now. We skip down to verse 7. He says, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Unity. And love begins with our heart. And he's going to show them, he's going to walk them through a progression of seeing how he shared love with them and then they can share love with each other. So he says, first of all, I have you in my heart. And we skip down to the end of that verse because you are all partakers with me of grace. These are people, we talk about a shared identity. Sometimes, yeah, we were on a football team together. We were on a team together. I played basketball some. I can look at those guys and say, we ran in sprints together, and it was tough, and we came out of it with a group and a team identity. I was in band, and we played together. We got up early together. We didn't like it, but we did it. And we went to practices, and we went to games. Even when we were 0-10, the band was together and we worked hard <laughs> to all play music as one. And he's saying, I love you, I have you in my heart because you are all partakers with me of grace. Our shared experience and common identity begins with grace and the fact that Jesus has given us a gospel that saves us from who we were and brings us into him. Verse 8, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all. That means that I want to be with you with the affection of Jesus Christ. God did not just uh, heartlessly give us this gospel. He gave us the affection of Jesus Christ. That means Jesus loves us, and when he died for us on the cross, that was out of love. It was not just, I have to do this. Here I go. No, it was thinking of us. He was thinking of this church. He was thinking of the people in Philippi, and of the girl who was trapped in sin, and that that. God freed through Paul. He was thinking of us. He was thinking of me as an eight-year-old. And he said, I love that kid even though he doesn't know me and he hasn't obeyed me yet. And he says, now I love you with the affection of Jesus Christ. So I love you because we had this shared experience and with that same love, I want to see you and I want to be with you. Does that describe you and how you see your church? I don't know if it always does for me, honestly. Sometimes I get to go to church this morning. <laughs> I'm kind of tired. This guy's saying, I love you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And then we go to verse 9. He says, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Not just I love you because of grace, but you all experience grace together and you have this. And now I pray that your love grows more and more. I pray that you realize the experience that you have. And this is, this is bigger than any sports team. This is bigger than any hometown or anything that you could have uh, in the world. This is God's grace being poured out to you. And I pray that your love may abound. That means grow big still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. This is not something that ends. This is a love that lasts until Jesus comes back. But hear this, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I pray that, that the love that God shows you and that I have for you now grows in you and among one another so that you can grow and bear fruit in Jesus. Not just so that God can love you, but now you can start to change and it starts to become obvious what kind of people you are. Fruit doesn't mean like, 
You start growing pears out of your hands or something. It means that people can see who you are. If you're an orange tree, that was dumb, and some of y'all laughed at it. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to take a break from that one real quick. I mean, y'all are still laughing. That's weird. Sorry, I just needed, to, needed some water, so I said something dumb. Give us an excuse to stop. If you're an apple tree, you grow apples. That's who you are. If you're an orange tree, you don't grow apples, you grow oranges. And what he's saying here is that you may be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. If Jesus has made you something new and he's put something inside you, then it should be able to work its way out. And one of those is love. Now you might be thinking, what does this have to do with unity? Well, first of all, in that theme verse, he said, if there's any comfort of love, fulfill my joy by having the same love. We're supposed to be people, first of all, before we can act in the same direction or think the same way, we have to let our hearts be transformed by Christ. There is superficial unity. There is unity in groups outside of us. There, are, there is unity, if you will, in workplaces and in schools where people are working towards the same goal. They have the same idea. We're here for one thing. He said to the glory and praise of God in verse 11. We can work towards the same thing, but the the way we have to do it and we have to start is by loving one another. Me and you can, can go down and mow somebody's yard that needs it. Maybe they had surgery and they need us to mow their yard. Maybe we take them some food and not talk to each other the whole time. Brother Sean, I don't like you very much. So it's my job. And I'm going to mow this yard, but I ain't talking to you one time in it. How, I, I, it's a joke kind of, but how many times have we gone and we look at somebody that we work with at, at Bible school or in Sunday school, or maybe we're sitting across from in a pew and we're like, mm, I could do without that one. <laughs> like, I don't know if I really love that one. Jesus, are you sure you love them? <laughs> That's the kind of, but he says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more. I pray that your love will grow. Not just that, that, that you'll tolerate someone. If we're going to really love the people outside of these walls and show them something different like he talked about in between those songs, how are we going to do that tolerating each other? If we have the love of Christ that has been pulled, poured out into us, how can we then turn around and refuse to give it to someone else? That's not fruit, That's poisoning the tree before it can bear fruit. That's saying, I refuse to live in what God has created for me. And it's difficult because we have these ideas and it's it's the Bible and it's words, but then we look at a real person sitting in a pew across from us. And we have to make a decision to say, I care about you more than me. And I deeply long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Those were his words. I really want to be with you. Sometimes we say, I love you, but I don't like you any. And I get that. But Paul was looking at people. He, He called out people by name at the end of this letter that are fighting and that are being a hindrance to the gospel being preached. And he says, I long for you too with the affection of Jesus Christ. We forget who we were and that we were sinners. And that Jesus looked at us when we were enemies of God and said, I want to be with you. And he died for you. He says, have the same love. Not love of just, I like the people in this church that are in my Sunday school class and that like me and have helped me in the past. Not just, I like the people that I sit with on my pew. It's the same love. I love the people that shake my hand when I get here and talk to me and the ones that don't. I love the ones that smile and the ones who are still working on that. It's the same love because Christ has poured out the same love in us. We cannot claim to have a shared experience of the gospel and to have personally had the love of God poured out into us and to refuse to give it to someone else. Church, I'm supposed to love you. I don't, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know all your names. I'm still struggling with that. I showed up here during COVID and y'all were all wearing masks. <laughs> And then I got up here and I do the kids' sermons. Y'all are like, hey, Caleb. And I was like, hey, brother. (laughs) So I'm working. I'm working. I promise you, I'm working. 
but I still love you and we're still working towards the same purpose and we still have the same goal. But we're not going to finish that goal if we're hating or even tolerating each other. So he encourages us to love in the pursuit of unity just as we've been loved by Christ. And I want you to remember that through the rest of this and through the rest of this year and in our time in this church that we are supposed to be one but it starts with love and from our heart and not just a conscious decision but allowing God to work out through us. But a church that loves is not necessarily one that is unified as God has intended. This is kind of scary because we can love each other. And we can say, I love my church, and I love worshiping with you. We can love showing up. We can shake people's hands if they're hurting. We can take them some food. We can send them a card. We can genuinely want to be with them and want what's best for them, but not have unity in the way that God has intended. I hear people here and in other churches say, I love my church, and I love that. I love that people here love this church, and this church has loved them. But that's step one. The second area of unity in our lives is in our purpose. Individually, did I add it? Never mind. And as a group. We have a purpose here. We have a reason for being here. So let's go to chapter 2, verse 1 again, to this theme set of verses. Therefore, if there is any consolation or encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. And I want to remind you that these things are from the gospel. These things are most highly shown in Jesus dying on a cross for us and giving us his life for ours. That's how he showed his love. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one, what does that say? Mind. If you're reading another translation, it might even say purpose. Of one reason for existing. If we need to be reminded what purpose means. One goal when you wake up in the mornings. One like idea of when we get together on a Sunday morning, this is what we're here for. I want you to have one mind. I want you to have one purpose, one goal in existing as a church and as Christians. See, God did not just pour out his love on those people in Philippi to let them say, yay, I'm going to heaven. He had a goal for them. Let's go back to chapter 1. He says in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. What is our purpose as a church? Is there really anything worth being unified towards? Are we supposed to just be sitting here as one, not doing anything, or is there a goal? And he thanked them in verse 5 for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. One of the, the principles and the, the themes that we find in, in this book is that what God has done in you becomes a part of who you are and what you do. So if God has shown love in you and poured that into you, then you become a loving person. He's, and he says, not just I thank you for your fellowship from the first day until now, that we have been one. He says, I thank you for your fellowship in the gospel that is in the good news of Jesus Christ, that he saw us who we were before we ever lived or existed, that he saw us as sinners, and, and as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that he died for our sins. That means in our place and knowing that we were dark on the inside and useless to him, he died for our sins, and that he was buried according to the scriptures, and that he rose again on the third day, and then, he, then that he was seen. And he says that this is the fellowship that we've had in that gospel, in Christ. And, and then he, he goes on, and this is, this is so cool, uh, from the first day until now. Now we're going to see how, we already saw how Paul, Paul saw his love for people. We're going to see how he saw the gospel. But he says from the very first day, from the day that you believed, you partnered with me in the good news. It doesn't just mean knowing it. We can keep going and then down into uh, 
verse 7, he says, Inasmuch as both in my chains, if you'll remember, he was in chains right before he led the Philippian jailer to the Lord. He loved the man who was part of torturing him and then helped baptize his family and teach them what it meant to know God. And right now he is in chains as he writes this letter in a Roman prison. He says, In my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Saw a minute ago that he said, You are all partakers with me of grace. And that was, that was the root of their identity. God's grace, his gift to them of a new life and a new way of living and thinking and being. But then he, I, I kind of skipped over this. And let's not miss it now. He says, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. The defense of the gospel. What does that mean? Well, we believe that Jesus died and he was buried and he came back to life and he ascended to the Father. And now he, paid, he has paid for our sin and he intercedes for us. Does everyone in the world believe that? This is one of those low-hanging fruit questions. No, not a chance. Not everyone in the world believes this. There are not only people that don't believe it, there are people who would attack it and try to stop it. That's why he's in jail. That's why when the Philippian jailer met the guy, he had to get him out of prison and go wash his wounds because they had been beating him. In the defense of the gospel, regardless of how it hurt me, I have been serving Christ and in the confirmation of it. So when I preach it, when the gospel, which means good news, by the way, and news is not news until it's spread, it's information, right? The people get robbed every day and shot every day. Not all of them make the five o'clock news. When they make the five o'clock news or the paper, that's when information becomes a piece of news, that's when it's spread. That's when we say this is news. And the gospel is not the news that someone has been hurt. It's good news. He's saying in the defense of preaching God's good word to people that need to hear it and in the confirmation of it. People that hear it and then have questions or want to know more, we are confirming it and building it up in their lives so that they can have the same grace that we do. You have been partakers with me of grace, but now you are sharing in the defense and confirmation of the gospel and spreading it throughout the world. That was his purpose. He doesn't just say um, uh, that 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 was theirs, he starts with himself. He says, in my chains, and then a defense and confirmation of the gospel. He started this. He was part of the reason that they are saved. In verse 7, he mentions the defense of the gospel. Verse 17, he says, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. To be appointed to something means for someone to give you a purpose. And he says, personally, I have been given the purpose by God himself to defend and to share good news with people. And now you are partakers of that good news and that gospel with me. You have shared in it. You have not only heard it, but you have believed in it. And so then the question is, is that our purpose? He was an apostle, right? Like, Caleb, you're a preacher. Brother Sean's a preacher. Brother Scott's a preacher. Y'all are supposed to do that, right? Who is this letter to in verse 1? To the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. This is primarily to you. He says, with those guys. (laughs) With them. But this is for you. Now that you've shared in this gospel, what do you do? Let's go to verse 27. He mentions this gospel again, and I think it's cool how he does it. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then this that is so profound, it's, it's simple, but it says a lot, so that whether I come and see you or, an ab- or am absent, whether I get out of this jail cell or not, I may hear of your affairs. That means I may hear of how you are living. That you stand fast in how many spirits? One spirit. With one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. With one mind. If we are going to have one mind, it cannot be my mind. 
if, if we are to have one mind, it cannot be Brother Sean's. It cannot be yours. It can't be Brother Scott's. It has to be the mind of Christ. And what the mind of Christ was, was that he came to earth to seek and save that which was lost and then to die as a sacrifice for us. That was his goal and his purpose, and it was in his mind the whole time. While he was loving, he was looking at people that he was going to die for and because of. And then Jesus didn't stick around to preach that good news. Hey, I died for you, now believe in me. No, he left. And the disciples were left looking like, what is going on? He left them, though, with a command to go and make disciples. So then the apostles, those 12 people, went. And they started in Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. And they went places. But there were 12 of them. They couldn't finish the work. You know what happened? The day after Paul is let out of jail, that night that he leads uh, the Philippian jailer to Christ, he says he goes with the believers and they run him out of town. He goes to Lydia's house. He meets with the believers there, and then he goes on his way. Not a very long trip, but that's how this church was started. And then were those people allowed to say, man, I'm glad we have some good news? No, no, God's plan the whole time was that Jesus would come and be the gospel for us, and then he would send the apostles, and then the apostles would go, and they would teach the word to other people, and they would teach it to other people. And those apostles are long dead, but people have passed on that gospel from generation to generation from us, and we have God's word. And now, at Center Fort Baptist Church, we are believers of the gospel. And this same command is for us. He says, I want to hear of it, that you stand fast in one spirit. Not just in your mind or in your heart, but in your spirit, in the deepest parts of you, with one mind. That means with one purpose, with one goal, striving, working hard. For the faith of the gospel. That means the defense, the confirmation, the preaching. He says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That means in each other, that we are preaching the gospel to each other. And helping each other and understand what it means to live differently because of what Jesus has done in our hearts. The gospel does not give us an excuse to sit down, but to keep working and to live differently in Christ. And now, our purpose is to share that gospel with people. Why is unity in the gospel so important? Like, we're here, aren't we? God saved us. This has been just going through my mind, and I thought about it this week, and I hope I think about it even more as I grow in my walk with Christ. But we are in here, and the majority of us know Jesus. And we have had the love of God poured out in our hearts. But not everyone that needs to be saved has been saved yet. We drove by houses this morning. We drove by people in their cars and at work. We have talked to people, family members and friends, maybe even today, that have not been saved yet. They do not know Jesus. We, we know people, all of us, that while we've been given the love of God and it has become personal to me, yes, I know Jesus and I pray to him and I speak to him. We know someone that does not have that yet. And we act sometimes like, I don't know what God's will for my life is, and that person is right there beside us. Sometimes we wonder what our purpose as a church is or what is next for us. And yes, we have different small things that we need to do. We need to take steps. We need to start ministries and programs, and we need to worship here and gather on Sunday mornings. But do we have a purpose? I don't want to have to wait until heaven to ask the people that that are being judged beside us, what should I have done? They would tell us then, you should have told me about Jesus. You had your potlucks and your worship services and you had your Bible studies and you got together and you ate lunch or you ate breakfast and you talked and you had your Sunday school classes but you never left and then told me about Jesus. What was going on? Did it really matter to you? You had a whole church full of people, 200 of us-ish, here today. 
good Lord, what are we doing? Do we have good news? Because I, I, sometimes I'm not convinced we have good news. I'm convinced we have a good piece of information. And we love it and we hold on to it. I watched Lord of the Rings for the last two weeks. There's a creature named Gollum. And he has the ring. And it's the one ring, and, and there's this big bad guy, and his existence is tied to this ring, so they're trying to destroy it. And he loves this thing, and it's, it's a love that, that is destroying him, and he's holding on to it. He would kill, he did kill to have this ring, and he's holding on to these, this thing. He calls it my precious, which is weird, but it's, it's how he saw it. He saw it as something that was so, like, th- that he cared about, but he never once offered to give it to someone. He never said, this is the best thing in my life, here have some. He held on to it and he was willing to kill for it to not have to share it with someone. Sometimes I wonder, is that who we are? Would we rather hurt someone else than sacrifice our reputation to share the gospel with someone? It got quiet in here. Man, it's easy to say, I love you church. I love being with you. I love enjoying time with you. I love studying the Bible with you. It is difficult to go and to sacrifice a friendship or to embarrass ourselves maybe by sharing the gospel with someone we see in our community. But he says, not only I want you to do this, I want this that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs. I want you to go so far in one mind and spirit sharing the gospel with people that I hear about it a thousand miles away, that people are so excited by what is happening in Hot Springs, Arkansas, that people elsewhere hear about it and they say, man, that church is, they're not just having fun together, they're telling people about Jesus and stuff is happening. That's the exciting part of this. That's the encouragement part of this because sometimes we miss our purpose. Sometimes we need to be reminded of it. Sometimes God just encourages and he says, if you will with one mind and with unity and one purpose share the gospel with your community, then he can be glorified and his name can go through the whole earth. That's what it takes, one group of people saying, we're going to do this and we're going to do it and we're going to do it together. And then people will hear about it. People that not, that even that we aren't telling. We have a reputation in this community, but also we live in a time where people a thousand miles away can hear about what we're doing in 10 minutes from now. And that is exciting. We live in a unique time that, that, that God promises us promises us if we will get together and work for the good news that God has put inside our hearts, then it's gonna be uncomfortable. <laughs> but he can do great things through us. A church that that loves each other and then goes out together is much stronger than individuals catching fire here or there. Having an experience. People getting saved and saying, I want to tell somebody. And then kind of fizzling out because we say, I don't know if I want to go with you. Which I'm not preaching at you guys. It's (laughs) it's the same here. This is not me just trying to yell at you because I think you're all sinners and you're messed up. I am part of your church for a reason. I joined this church before you hired me for a reason, I think. Because I'm like you in a lot of ways and I need to work on the things with you that I'm preaching. I'm not special, so don't think I'm trying to say I'm better than you in any way. That's not at all the point of this. The fact is that I've been given something special. And you have too, and we have the job of carrying that to people. So where there's love and there's unity of purpose, there's one more element we have to have before biblical unity is achieved. You might say, what is that? Well, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 1. He says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Your mind is where you think from. He says, I want you to be like each other in how you think. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. One of the requirements, after we get our hearts and our purpose and our mind together, one of the requirements is that we have to decide to do this the same way. We cannot decide, I'm going to make my goal to love people and to share the gospel 
and I'm going to do whatever I have to, regardless of you all, to do that. Or maybe I've shared the gospel and now y'all should respect me because I've done a good job and I've taught a Sunday school class and I've preached or I, or I invited someone and then they joined the church and you all should think that I'm special. The third area of unity is in our mindset of humility. He says be like-minded and the way that he is thinking about and that is echoed throughout this book is through humility. We have a quite... A uh, clear definition of that mindset in chapter 2, verse 3. Read there with me. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Yeah. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let nothing be done because you care about number one. Nothing we do in this church even if we say it's for the gospel, should be, should be done for ourselves or so people will look at us and say, they've got it together. That is selfish ambition and conceit. He says, but in lowliness of mind, let each consider, let each esteem others better than himself. There's some irony, I think, in unity and in being one, in all being equal and working towards the same goal, is that for you to be one, and for you to be a part of a group that has unity, you have to see yourself as below the group, as less worthy of honor, and less worthy of respect, and less worthy of time and effort and energy than the person next to you. And so then he goes on to say, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We all know that we're going to feed ourselves we're going to take care of our family. We're going to tell them about Jesus. We're going to invite them. But I should not only care about myself, I should care more about you and that you are learning in the gospel. You are bearing fruit. Your love is growing. That, that you are being maybe even recognized for the good work that you've done. And as we all push each other ahead of ourselves, as I do my best to honor you and even you honor me. Because he says, later, that workers are worthy of their honor. As we work, we don't look for honor for ourselves, saying, hey, we made a church that loved each other and preached the gospel, and we grew, and now we've got 500 people here, and we're better than you guys. <laughs> no, none of that. It is we are here for Jesus. He says, let yourself have the same mind. Verse 5 of chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Your mind should be the mind of Christ. And this is one of my favorite chapters. I think it was actually the first sermon, one of the first that I heard Brother Scott preach. It was at Bog Springs and like at Next Camp like eight or nine years ago, one, my first year going. And he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. That means having equality, all the characteristics, all the nature and the glory and the holiness of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Did not, he was not like Satan that said, I want to be elevated to God's place. Even though Jesus was equal with him, he did not claim that, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant or a slave and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus, who deserved all praise and had been praised by the angels since the beginning of time, said, I do not want that anymore. And he humbled himself. It says being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And that does not mean that he was prideful or arrogant before. That means he was willing to, to know what he deserved and what he was worth and then to say, I'm giving that up because I love you. And he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. If there is one person that has ever existed that deserved for people to honor them and to praise them and respect them, it was Christ. If there's one person that we should have said, that, you did good. <laughs> You've done well. You, you deserve a throne. You deserve the best place in the, in the church, the best seat at the table. You deserve to go first at the potluck so you can get what you want. It was Jesus. Did Jesus claim that? Absolutely not. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. Even death on a cross, which is the most shameful and humiliating type of death possible. 
But let us remember this, that verse 9, therefore God also has highly exalted him. God has lifted him up and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, Jesus died and he was buried, but God raised him so we could have salvation in him, so we could experience his love and the, be the purpose of his humility. And now we know that one day, because we have that love in our hearts, that when we bow our knee and confess that Jesus is Lord, it will be with a willing heart, acknowledging that we have already been giving our lives to him. But that purpose, our purpose, what are we here for? There will be other people that we know who bow their knee and who admit that Jesus is Lord and he is who he says he was, And that they could have believed in him, but they didn't. And that is our purpose. So that at the day of Christ, it says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that we can glorify our God as one church by saying that that we worked for you and we shared your good news. This is the mind of Christ. We cannot claim to be a Christian and to love him and to want to be like him without thinking like he thinks and loving like he loves and living like he lives. And this is, this is it. To love, to have the same purpose, and to do it the same way with humility. Me honoring you and you honoring each other. Counting each other more important than yourself. Practically, what can we do here? Uh, we're going to wrap it up in just a, just a little bit. Uh, at the end of this, in chapter 4, verse 2, there are a couple of people that are not embodying unity. And if we're honest, at, at some point or another, you and I have each not embodied or shown unity in our church. We have become arrogant or selfish or done things for ourselves. And there are two specific people. He says, I implore Yodia and I implore Seneki to be of the same mind in the Lord, to have this mind of Christ. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. These were people who at one point had labored in the gospel and they had their purpose and their minds were set on it and they led people to Jesus and now for whatever reason, they no longer have unity. And I think uh, he's he's talking to them but he also talks to, he says, my true companion. We need to be peacemakers. We need to be agents and God's ambassadors for unity in this church. If you see people that are not embodying this, the easiest thing to do is say, man, I hope Brother Scott has a good time with that one. (laughs) Or maybe you are not (laughs) the one that's showing unity right now. What we need to do is we need to be people that create unity, that heal bonds. And if we are those people, if I have a problem with you or you with me, then we need to go. He, He did directly ask them, be of the same mind. We need to go to people and heal those differences so that we can work together. And, and then this is really interesting. He says, whose names are in the book of life. We need to remember who we are. Because all of these things that we are supposed to do and be and think like are because God has given us eternal life. And your name is written in the book of life. That means your life is no longer yours to live how you want. But one day God is going to exalt you to heaven too. I pray that for this church so we can have unity to the gospel. I pray that the people that we're about to baptize and accept into our membership, that they will become a part of a church that has one goal and one mind and one purpose. And that we can do this for Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and as musicians come, um, consider, I guess, your own life and your own heart. Do you recognize the grace and the great love that God has given you? Maybe that's why it's sometimes hard to love other people. Have you accepted the gospel? Maybe it's hard to share the gospel with people because you haven't believed it yourself. Or maybe you don't completely understand it. Maybe it's hard to be humble because you haven't realized that Christ humbled himself for you. And that's okay. God isn't angry angry at us for what we did yesterday. He cares about who we're going to be tomorrow. So please pray with me, and then let's sing. God, I thank you for this day and for time with my church. 
Lord, I do love my church, and we thank you for loving us. We ask that you'll be with us, that you'll preach the gospel to our hearts. Lord, help us to understand it, and then as we go throughout this week and through the rest of our time in our church and on our teaching and on our learning and on our worship, help us to do it for you and for your gospel and your glory alone. In Jesus' name.
Yeah. <laughs> 